Hello and welcome to the special edition of the interview. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay and we have a very special guest with us today from hacker to minister. The journey of Audrey Tang is a fascinating one. She's the world's first transgender minister and Taiwan's first digital minister. Four years after she took the position, Audrey Tang is fighting the Wuhan virus pandemic through technology, an effort that helped Taiwan become a success story for the world. So what's different about Taiwan's response? How did Taiwan hack this pandemic? And how can the world replicate this success story? To discuss all of this and more, I'm joined by Audrey Tang, the digital minister of Taiwan. Hello. Uh, you're a software programmer, uh, and you've been described as one of the 10 greats of Taiwanese computing personalities. And now you're the digital minister of Taiwan, which is already among the most digitized places on earth. What is your job all about as digital minister? So my job description goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Very interesting. Uh, a story in Wired describes how you, and I'm quoting from what they said, hacked the pandemic by building technology tools to support the fight against the Wuhan virus. Uh, professional comedians, I'm told, were hired to bust fake news, and Taiwan remains one of the success stories of this pandemic. What did Taiwan do differently, and what role did technology play in this fight? So first of all, I think uh, we trusted the citizens. That is the most important part. And then comes the technology, including, of course, soap, most important technology, and also medical mask. Uh, I think there's three pillars for deployment of social innovation, and that's fast, fair, and fun. The fast part ensures that whenever there's anything that's learned from the collective intelligence, for example, on PTT, our equivalent Reddit, last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the whistleblower from the PRC, posted out there, and I quote, seven new SARS cases in the Wuhan seafood market, unquote, um, it got reposted immediately and escalated into our medical offices because people upvoted it. And the very next day, starting January the 1st, we started health inspections from flights from Wuhan to Taiwan. So that's really fast. And anyone can call this toll-free number 1922 to report anything on the ground, not only to get explanations, but actually inform the daily CECC Central Epidemic Command Center press conference. So that's the fun part. Um, the fun part uh, is a spokesdog of the CECC that translates all the interesting ideas about, for example, wearing a mask into cute dog pictures. Uh, and so that people understand, like, for example, wearing a mask is not just to protect others, but protect oneself so that one will not be, for example, touching one's own face uh, with unwashed hands. Uh, and that's not very easy to remember. So the spokesdog or Zong Chai from the CECC um, posted this. Uh, so that everybody can see this spokesdoc uh, and putting hands to their mouth uh, and say that uh, wear a mask to protect you uh, from your own unwashed hands. Uh, and then, for example, on physical distancing, uh, we would say when you're indoor, please keep three dogs away uh, from each other and outdoor keep two dogs or Shiba Inu away from one another. And so this makes sure that this is um, trendy meme uh, spreads faster than rumor and disinformation. And finally, the fair part in uh, fast, fair, and fun ensures that everybody who want to, for example, get a medical mask can very easily do so and collect it in their nearby pharmacies. And the uh, idea is that each pharmacist, which is very professional and trusted in their neighborhood already, is in charge of making sure that people with their NHI card can collect, if they're an adult, nine medical masks per two weeks, or if they're a child, then 10. Uh, but uh, the pharmacist is not the whole story. The pharmacists work with civic technologists uh, to build maps such as this one. So you can go to a nearby pharmacy and expect that the person queuing before you, if they look like an adult, swipe their NHI card, and the real-time availability in that map will drop from 58 to 49. Uh, and if it rather goes up, you will probably call 1922 right there. Uh, and so people uh, build this kind of distributed ledgers, uh, more than 140 different chatbots, maps, and so on, so that everybody can rest assured that when we're ramping up the medical mass production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day, everybody understands that this is fair, and everybody can get their fair share of it. At the end, we reach more than 95% of population with this system. 
Quite an incredible story this. In a recent talk, uh, Audrey, you had shared that Taiwan began countering the Wuhan virus last year itself. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. uh, do you think that has contributed significantly to how you've, uh, you've been able to fight the pandemic and how did the outbreak come uh, in China, come on your radar? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Dr. Li Wenliang's uh, whistleblowing on the social media there, uh, although it um, got harmonized a little bit in the first week uh, there in Wuhan, it gets escalated into medical officers' attention immediately in Taiwan. So in a sense, we're very grateful to Dr. Li Wenliang. He literally saved uh, Taiwanese people. And so because we reacted early, that means that we never had to go to a lockdown. There was no lockdown in Taiwan, just as there's no uh, administrative takedown of online disinformation. Because in either case, the pandemic and infodemic, we were able to react in real time so that we make sure that people understand on this side uh, the physical distancing, the use of masks, soap, and so on. So we keep the R value under one at all times. Times. And here we use the cute dog and so on to make sure that people are vaccinated because when you laughed about it, you would not share the conspiracy theory that travels on outrage. There are a number of lessons that, of course, the world can take from Taiwan, but uh, Taiwan has been denied a voice at the World Health Organization. Taiwan tried to get an observer status, but the move was postponed. How can you export or share the Taiwan model uh, to fight the Wuhan virus without being part of the WHO? So right before the World Health Assembly, we had our own digital um, pre-WHA assembly uh, that we shared this playbook, uh, or so-called Taiwan model, uh, which you can read about in Taiwan Can Help That Us. Uh, it's a website built by the civil society uh, with um, pretty much everybody. Uh, and so all the 14 different jurisdictions, uh, including the United States, um, with Secretary Azar, uh, who are very interested in the Taiwan model, uh, just started working with us on a bilateral epicenter to epicenter basis uh, and um, well he just recently visited Taiwan so I'm sure that even without the ministerial access provided by the WHO which we were denied um, we can uh, make our own uh, ministerial conversation ground using digital technology and WHO of course still allows Taiwan some sort of very limited scientific access but unless you're a country where the vice president is both the top epidemiologist and also the political authority like in the case of Taiwan one with VP Chen Jianren, um, having scientific access is not the same as having ministerial access, of course. Well, you've devised a way for Taiwan to participate in the meetings of United Nations digitally and circumvent the barriers imposed by China. Can you share more about the strategy with us and what sort of support do you need from the global community to implement these plans? Well, um, I, uh, of course, always, even before the pandemic, preferred uh, travel through a robotic double uh, or the double robot, the telepresence robot, um, or hologram, uh, or any sort of um, video conferencing. It could be as simple as having an iPad attached to a rotating chair. Uh, and I ask uh, my colleagues or uh, some other countries delegate to help uh, rotate my chair. Um, and all these are preferred uh, first because I adjust jet lag very slowly. Um, and so it's actually better for my health uh, and also it's better for the planet as well because it reduces the carbon uh, footprint caused by air travel so um, yeah I've been attending for example the Internet Governance Forum in Geneva this way uh, as well as many other UN uh, related meetings and uh, for all people's concerns, uh, I think we eventually established this as pretty much uh, on the record, uh, but not a personal representation. It's more like a representation uh, of a video stream uh, from Taipei. And nowadays, because many of those ministerial meetings are moving online anyway, there's no difference between a member seat and an observer seat. Everybody is just a rectangle anyway. Um, and so I think a lot of diplomatic norms are being uh, changed uh, because of digital technology. Right. Uh, China has also become uh, more aggressive in the region. Military action has been stepped up. There is a standoff with India as well. As a minister in the Taiwanese cabinet, how do you assess the threat posed by China to its neighbors? 
So back in 2014, when we occupied the parliament for 22 days in Taiwan, we deliberated on this very topic. Uh, it's called the Sunflower Movement. And so for 22 days, around 20 different NGOs each deliberated on one part of a trade agreement uh, with Beijing, which we did not uh, sign, by the way. Uh, that's the result of the Occupy the, uh, deliberation. And I remember that because I facilitated the conversation in all the different um, deliberation places, uh, there's one uh, topic that talks about whether at the time we're still deploying the 4G connectivity um, and whether we need to allow a PRC, uh, that's People's Republic of China regime, uh, components into our 4G system. Uh, and so I think the consensus on the street was that there's no such thing as a pure private sector player um, in the PRC regime because everybody knows that they have party branches uh, and so the, dang, the, the party there uh, can just swap leadership uh, for any so called privately held uh, companies if they wish. Uh, and so it turns out to be not a property of the software or hardware, but whether we want to have a past dependency. Uh, because when you build something with 4G with PRC technology, then you're very likely to also rely on it for 5G. Uh, and then uh, on the 5G, because the software runs on the edge uh, and it's harder to track. It has a, a larger uh, surface for cybersecurity assaults. Um, we determined the total co cost of ownership is far higher than its initial bid, because for each update, uh, we have to do another systemic risk assessment. And so the consensus on the street with half a million people in the street and many more online back in 2014 was that we do not allow PRC components in our 4G infrastructure. And so we've been um, living off this, I think the latest term is called clean network, uh, clean path um, for six years. We're happy to see that other jurisdictions are now doing their own systemic uh, risk assessments, but we've reached our consensus long ago. Right, you're only talking on the technology front. I'm talking about uh, uh, the threat that China poses to its neighbors uh, in terms of its military aggression. Well, um, we do see, for example, the political warfare unit, uh, and for example, the Zhongyang Zhengfa, where the central political and law unit um, posting obviously untrue disinformation in the Taiwanese social media. I guess that counts uh, as something that you're asking about and that happens to overlap with my um portfolio. Uh, I don't talk about things uh, outside my portfolio. Uh, and so, for example, before our election last November, there was a, uh, and I quote, um, uh, Hong Kong sucks compensation exposed. Killing a police earns you up to 20 million, unquote. Um, this piece of disinformation being spread with a scary looking photo. Uh, and the photo was real. It was a Reuters photo. But the Reuters report says nothing uh, about um, killing police or being paid for it. It just says that there, there are young protesters um, in the Hong Kong anti ELA protest. Because in Taiwan, we don't do administrative takedown. We only do notice and public notice. So According to the Taiwan Fact Check Center, a member of the International Fact Check Network, we looked um, into what caused this new uh, caption to form, like the 13 years old is being paid and so on. Reusing the same photo, we trace it back, um, as I mentioned, to the Zhuang Shen Fanwei, to the essentially the political propaganda unit. And so instead of taking it down, we just made sure that everybody in Taiwan on the social media, when they're sharing this photo, understand that if they see the caption on the other side, this is actually sponsored, uh, made. Uh, as a disinformation by uh, somebody uh, from Beijing. And that's uh, the kind of work that we do both before the election and also during the pandemic. The United States and China are find, fighting on many fronts and technology is an important battleground. Chinese tech giants face bans the world over. What role then can Taiwan play in terms of filling the gap that such bans will create? Well, first of all, we're a, a kind of living example, right? If people think that, um, you know, having no past dependency on PRC components means that one cannot build 4G or 5G, well, I'm using a 5G phone, <laughs> that is doing perfectly well uh, without PRC components in our telecommunication infrastructure. And not only can we share this kind of uh, know-how of building the communication technology stack uh, with um, other people, we can also join together uh, and form 
uh, this kind of clean network um, um, investment uh, to make sure that people, for example, in the uh, countries that uh, are more landlocked or for which internet access is more expensive, um, that they have a, a viable plan uh, of network connectivity without having to rely on partially uh, PRC state subsidized development plans. Do you fear that Taiwan might also get caught in a proxy battle between the United States and China? Well, uh, I would say that the proxies that we see are the VPN proxies, uh, and then the VPN proxies are coming from the PRC side uh, because they have uh, restricted the gray firewall, um, that's their name, not mine, uh, so much uh, it's now getting very difficult for people within the PRC internet um, to have a taste of the open internet. It uh, used to be an easy thing, but it now requires a technical sophistication as well as an act of kind of like civil disobedience. Um, and so uh, in Taiwan's case, of course, uh, we still make sure that uh, we work in the open internet. As I said, we do not harmonize uh, the whistleblowing. We do not um, do administrative takedown and so on. Uh, and so I, I think we do this because we are a liberal democracy and this is what our constitution um, set us to do. Uh, and the, during the pandemic, we do not, for example, pass a state of emergency. We're operating strictly within the constitutional limits. So I wouldn't say that this is against uh, PRC or something, but uh, we are saying that you do not have to make a choice between human rights and democracy on one side and public health uh, and um, fighting of the coronavirus on the other side. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. You can do uh, two uh, at the same time. Earlier this year, you'd said that putting Chinese equipment in a country's core telecom infrastructure is like inviting a Trojan horse. Do you believe mm -hmm. that the world is only waking up to something that, that you'd alerted them to long ago? Yeah, I, I was uh, just quoting uh, what people said during the Sunflower Occupy. I didn't invent um, that uh, Greek mythology, nor that um, metaphor. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we tried uh, to sound the alarm uh, long ago, uh, and I'm really happy that people are now doing their own systemic uh, risk assessments around the world. What do you make of India's decision to ban Chinese apps? Well, um, I'm aware that uh, people are looking at it not only as a cybersecurity issue, but also as a privacy issue. And although the cybersecurity issue, of course, are on people's minds, for example, people would not want their phones to become botnets uh, and so on, the privacy issue is actually the most um, important one to me. And to this uh, end, in Taiwan, we're also working uh, on the fundamental acts of an independent data protection authority, which we hope to pass um, sometime soon in the next session or the next one. Uh, and once we we do that, we are also looking into the privacy assessments uh, of not only the domestic um, software, but also the non-domestic software as well. So I, I think we have a lot to learn uh, from India of how to do such assessments uh, to our um, hopefully uh, soon to be founded data protection authority. Uh, the FBI has just warned American businesses against uh, uh, tie-ups with Chinese companies and say that Chinese firms steal intellectual property and, and uh, and trade details, trade data. Uh, do other countries face a similar threat and what can they do to, to up their defenses against Chinese snooping? Well, I think, uh, of course, having a legal system that honors uh, trade secrets uh, would be a very good uh, first step. And also just becoming generally aware of this possibility uh, would make sure that people have good hygienic practices, uh, like using strong passwords, uh, not uh, leaving their credentials uh, in plain text in store, uh, use more of a browser instead of downloading arbitrary software for video conferencing, uh, and things like that. This is as uh, easy uh, in Taiwan to um, to get into people's minds uh, because of the uh, deliberation that we had in 2014 as uh, using a mask and use soap to wash your hands. Uh, both stops uh, these possible um, vectors uh, at a very edge of the network. Well, you know China triggered a border standoff with India and uh, there, there have been calls to boycott Chinese goods in India, especially Chinese technology products. And many in India are advocating uh, for a closer relationship with Taiwan. What sort of potential do you see in the India-Taiwan relationship? Well, I'm happy to uh, know that in the Indo-Pacific um, 
region, um, India being a liberal democracy, uh, also values um, the ideas of innovation uh, instead of the other kind of um, work, non-innovation, as is just uh, alluded to. Uh, and so when I was e working with Silicon Valley companies, um, I think um, the India people are the, the ones that I'm most acquainted with, and I have no uh, problem working with uh, more people uh, from India to Taiwan or from Taiwan to India um, in ways to uh, build such liberally democratic um, ideas. And so uh, in Taiwan, we have this idea of a gold card. You can remain a India citizen, but visit Taiwan. Um, and if you're one of the professionals working on these kind of innovation-related industries, you do not have to work for a Taiwanese employer. Rather, you can be a digital nomad uh, and <coughs> just get a certificate uh, to work, to stay uh, in Taiwan for three years uh, up to, uh, and then you can renew it. And if you really like Taiwan, uh, you can also get Taiwanese citizenship without having to renounce your India one. Uh, and so if you're interested in that program, you can check out TaiwanGoldCard.com. But India does not recognize Taiwan as a separate country yet. Do you expect uh, that stand to change with the changing circumstances? Have you received any new signals from New Delhi? Well, as long as uh, dot .tw uh, resolves uh, to the TW NIC and some other IP address as a digital minister, this is what I care about. You don't care about India recognizing your country? I care about the digital realm. Uh, I'm working with Taiwan. I'm not working for Taiwan. Uh, and so because of that, I'm trying not to get into the um, you know, Westphalian um, metaphors, uh, because for me, uh, the internet governance uh, by itself uh, is based on people understanding of, of the end-to-end -end principle, the permissionless innovation and such. Uh, and so uh, your question, of course, pertains uh, to our foreign service, but it's better for Joseph, our foreign minister, to answer. Right, we'll wait to speak to him. Uh, in the meantime, since you want to only talk about technology, you've said that you believe that technology can strengthen democracies. But around the world, we're witnessing how technology is causing more disruption. Fake news is influencing uh, elections. Social media is driving up hate. What are some of the threats that technology poses today? And what can governments do to handle these challenges? Yeah, this is a really good question, and thank you for uh, sticking to the technology realm. Um, and I would say two things. First, that uh, the social media does not have to be anti-social. We built many social media uh, programs like join the GOV.tw or VTaiwan that only uh, make sure that people can ideate, brainstorm, upload, and download. But because there's no reply button, there really is no way for trolls to grow. Uh, and so not all social media need to be anti-social. Some could be pro-social. Uh, that's my first observation. The next observation is that even on Facebook and Twitter and so on, um, still outrage uh, or the kind of divisiveness is not the only story. Uh, we still see, I don't know, cute cats and dogs and things like that, uh, that travels with a higher R value, that is to say, uh, by default, more people will share it per hour uh, as compared to conspiracy theories or things that travels on outrage. And indeed, the humor over rumor um, counter disinformation playbook from Taiwan uh, banks on this idea so that our real-time clarifications are so funny uh, that people will laugh about it and share it. And once you laugh about something, really there is no room uh, for outrage. Uh, and so that is the main idea that I would like to share uh, with the governments, that instead of uh, only relying on administrative takedowns uh, or on fact-checkers uh, that are very diligent but have a very limited uh, R value, uh, it, it should work with the fact-checkers, not as fact-checker, because fact-checkers are journalists and governments are not journalists, um, but we need to empower everybody to learn about the journalism, to learn about what we call media competency, so that people, instead of just literacy, like uh, watching televisions, could also be producers uh, using their own phones and tell a balanced story from their angle and therefore contribute to democracy. And so this is what we mean uh, by media competence and what we mean by humor over rumor. Well said, uh, Audrey Tang, and I'm sure uh, most of us can take notes here. And it was a pleasure talking to you, even though you did not answer anything beyond the realm of technology. Good to have you on Vion. Yeah, thank you. Live long and prosper.